historically excluded groups um, are supported. Um, so we do this in a lot of different ways, but, but just to mention one, um, we're about to launch a funding program to defray the costs of field experiences, which can be um, really transformative for our students. Um, but, but gear to be out in the field, like scuba gear, can be prohibitively expensive. Um, and it can be a, beer, a barrier to our students having these um, really profound research experiences. Um, and we have this great opportunity as being part of the CSU to really make headway in an effort to make sure that the California Ocean and Coastal Workforce uh, is reflective of California's racial and ethnic um, diversity. So I, I think I'm reading this audience fairly to say that, um, you know, we believe po uh, policy should be informed by good science. And in fact, uh, several people have made mention of this today. Um, in fact, I think it's such a wide held belief within environmental policy that um, I think some of us think that the way science and policy interact is straightforward. Um, my perception is that it's a lot more complicated than it first might seem. Um, and despite the best of intentions, there's sometimes just a mismatch between scientists and policymakers, and this can occur for a lot of different reasons. So we're promoting the integration of science and policy through a new program that we call the State Science Information Needs Program. The cornerstone of this program is that we work with state agencies to develop competitive requests for proposals around their specific scientific needs. Rather than applicants telling us how they think um, policy decision makers could use their science, we ensure from the beginning that the state agencies will use the results. And by next month, when we fund our last round of funding, our, our third and last, um, our activities will have resulted in 3.1 million of new research being conducted at the CSU. And these um, iterative um, interactions between CSU faculty members and state agencies, we really think this is key to um, developing these long-term durable partnerships between scientists and policymakers. And it's this type of partnership that is really going to further science to policy integration. So I'm, I'm really excited for today. We've been working really hard on this presentation, and it's our first uh, first big opportunity to share the results of one of our funded uh, projects. The one you're going to hear about today is being led by Dr. Unha Ho from San Diego State uh, University. But first, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Scott Coffin, who leads efforts at the State Water Resources Control Board to monitor and manage microplastic pollution in drinking water and the marine environment. Um, Scott began researching microplastic effects on aquatic organisms and humans in 2014, starting with his graduate research in environmental toxicology at UC Riverside. Um, Scott is one of those state agency folks that I mentioned at the beginning that really helped us develop our request for proposals and helped us evaluate, um, evaluate proposals. And I wanted to say I'm being um, pretty brief in my introductions today. Some of you may have received our um, speaker biographies ahead of time. My colleague Kim is also going to share those and a briefing paper on microplastics um, through the chat. So with that, um, I will now turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Amy. Really happy to be here. Um, I can go ahead and screen share. Once able, alrighty. So the plastic waste the plastic waste crisis has recently gained attention in the media. It seems that everywhere we look, we find these plastic particles from the deepest part of the ocean to the tallest mountain. While plastic degrades very slowly in the environment, 
it does rapidly break down into smaller particles. Once they're below about five millimeters, we call these microplastics. We are currently exponentially increasing the production of plastic. And if we continue with business as usual, we will double the rate at which plastic enters the environment by the year 2030. Recent studies have found microplastics in 93% of US drinking water and plastic packaging is known to contribute significantly to our exposure. One study found that babies could consume up to a million microplastics per day just from those polypropylene feeding bottles. Additionally, we're breathing microplastics all the time and between two and 13% of indoor dust is made of plastic. Once consumed, plastics accumulate in organs and they can be transferred to our offspring through the placenta. Studies in rodents have found the accumulation of microplastics in the brain, lung, liver, testes, and ovaries. The only study to look for microplastics in human placentas has found them in four out of six samples. A study published just last week developed a method to quantify microplastics in human blood. They applied this method to 22 people and found detectable levels of microplastics in 17 of those people. This is an important advancement as this will allow us to determine actual human exposure, which is an, an important part of estimating risk. To address public concerns of microplastics, the California legislature passed two groundbreaking bills in 2018. Senate Bill 1422 mandates that the state monitor for microplastics in drinking water and, if necessary, issue health-based guidance levels regarding acceptable levels in drinking water. The second bill, Senate Bill 1263, also authored by Senator Portentino, mandates that the Ocean Protection Council will submit a, a statewide microplastic strategy by the end of this year, or by the end of last year, and conduct monitoring and assess risks. To meet the legislative mandates to assess risks of microplastics, we convened a health effects workshop with global experts to develop risk assessment frameworks and apply them using available data. This was accomplished through a meta-analysis of the available toxicity literature, and we examined relationships between particle characteristics and toxicity, adverse effect pathways, and dose response. Our working group developed screening criteria for assessing the reliability of studies and applied these to the 29 existing rodent studies for microplastics. Of these, we found 12 that were fit for purpose, which we went on to further scrutiny. Of these reliable studies, four reported effects on male reproduction and two reported effects on female reproduction. These studies consistently showed adverse impacts to sperm deformity and sperm count, as well as decreased testosterone in male rodents. Despite these findings that indicate impacts to male and female reproductive systems are likely from microplastics, we cannot quantitatively assess the risks to humans just yet. Our expert work group found three significant problems that prevent a quantitative risk assessment to humans, which includes an inadequate effects database with limited information on the relative toxicity between different polymers, shapes, and sizes, unknown effect mechanisms, and incomplete exposure data. Science is needed to assess human health risks of microplastics. And right now we are about five to 10 years out in terms of being able to accurately and quantitatively assess these risks. We need exposure data on what we are drinking, breathing, and eating. We also need high quality laboratory toxicity studies to determine how the effects are occurring and at what concentrations they occur. In addition to assessing risks to humans through drinking water, our expert group also assessed risks to aquatic ecosystems to fulfill the requirements of Senate Bill 1263. Our expert group identified numerous ways in which microplastics harm wildlife. In addition to effects from associated chemicals, plastic also causes toxicity through its biological interactions as a particle. Plastics can entangle animals, and once they're ingested, they cause internal lacerations, food dilution, and can even accumulate in tissues and cause cellular damage. Our expert workshop workshop determined that there is significant evidence regarding the ecological effects of microplastics and developed a tiered risk-based framework to assess and manage those risks. This, man this framework is made up of several tiers from protective to predictive of adverse effects with management 
actions associated with those tiers. For example, if there's an exceedance of the lowest threshold, we would advise increased monitoring, whereas an exceedance of the highest threshold may induce more aggressive management strategies or even fish consumption advisories. A similar risk assessment has been completed for the world's oceans, uh, looking prospectively under a business as usual scenario. They found minimal risk currently in the world's oceans, 0.17%. Uh, However, if we increase with business as usual, these risks are expected to increase up to 1.62% for the, the global world's oceans, with enclosed water bodies like the Mediterranean and the Yellow Sea expected to have much higher risks than out in the open ocean. Even if we could magically stop producing plastic altogether today, microplastics concentrations in the environment will continue to increase exponentially in the environment. This is due to the breakdown of existing macroplastic debris that's already out there. So right now we have the opportunity to reduce this inevitable plastic toxicity debt that we will pass on to later generations. To address this wicked problem, the California Ocean Protection Council adopted a comprehensive statewide microplastic strategy this year, which plots the path forward to monitoring and managing the problem with science and policy tools. The Ocean Protection Council strategy takes a two-pronged approach, which includes some multi-benefit, no-regret solutions to act on the problem now and science to inform future actions. This strategy is both bold and ambitious and will require input from many stakeholders in all sectors. The strategy recognizes that risk management should not just occur once plastic has already become waste or has already entered the environment. By addressing the problem at every stage, from a system level approach focused on circularizing our economy, all the way to improving waste management, we can avoid pursuing ineffective solutions that shift the burdens onto one, onto other locations, communities, or sectors. The strategy's science needs call for monitoring in the environment to assess risks, identify sources and pathways into the environment, and develop solutions based on those findings. By repeating this process on a continual basis, we can monitor the success of these intervention strategies and adapt them accordingly. The first step in monitoring is developing a standardized method. Through a partnership with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, we develop standardized methods using two types of instruments for drinking water, ocean water, fish tissue, and sediment. The method performance was evaluated through an interlaboratory validation study with 40 labs in seven different countries. And this is one of the first ever standardized methods for microplastics. With these new standardized methods, we can now begin monitoring in California's waters. The National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine released a report in 2021 that recommends the US develop a national microplastics monitoring network. We as in California can lay the groundwork for this coordinated national network. With that, thank you very much. I'll pass it over to Amy. Thank you so much, Scott. That was wonderful. So our um, next speaker is Dr. Unha Ho with San Diego State University's School of Public Health. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, Dr. Ho leads a team that received funding from COAST to research the toxicological effects of synthetic microfibers and tire wear particles. Dr. Ho investigates diverse environmental pollutants and their impacts on human and ocean health. She is a member of the Ocean Protection Council Science Advisory Team and the California Environmental Contaminant Biomonitoring Program. Please go ahead, Unha. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I hope this works. Everybody can see the slide. Yes, we can. Do you hear me well too? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for inviting me to give a presentation today. I'm really honored to share the uh, study, our project with all the audience today. Uh, today, um, I will um, introduce the project, which was funded uh, by the CSU Coast. Um, 
And also, this is not just my study. This is the multiple researchers and students in our university, in San Diego State University. Also, is a collaborative project with the University of Toronto, Oregon State University. Uh, we are very, very pleased to um, conduct this project with the experts in the SDSU and also outside of the campus as well. So uh, why we focus on this project? Why do we focus on tire particles and microfibers in this project? There are various kinds of microplastics out there. Why we focus on these two products? First, tire particles and microfibers are common in the California water environments. Tire particles comprises 50% of micro particles in the storm water runoff in California. Microfibers are major microplastic in wastewater. Many originate from laundry and clothing. Also, these two microplastic types are known to harm the environments from, by multiple studies. One of the very important study is Pacific Northwest Coho Salmon experience increased the mortality from exposure to storm water containing tire wear particles, and specifically to a chemical, um, 60 ppd quinone, which is published in Science in 2021. And also the food dilution through consumption of microfibers can increase mortality and, and fitness in wildlife as well. And according to the California Ocean Science Trust report in 2021, there is a gap, there's a research gaps on exposure and fate and transport of microplastics and specifically their leachate as well. So our project, we focus on the leachates of the tire wear particles, but this presentation specifically, we're going to talk about the results of this. Okay, so what's the tire wear particles happens in the environment, and specifically in this California weather and the coastal environment conditions? The this diagram is is a, simplifies that um, tire wear particles in, in the coastal, specifically coastal environments. So the, the car generates and produces the tire wear particles and it, it settles on the street and the road. And we have a long dry season and with a very sunny days. If you think about it, all this solar, the sunlight really expose, you know, radiate these particles on the streets and roads. And what happens in the, when we enter the storm, the rainy season, and then the, all the rains comes to the, the, the roads and streets, and then it washes them out to the coastal environment. So we can kind of imagine it like definitely tire air particles go to the, the coastal environments that the study already found it. And then also this tire air particles will leach the chemicals, because if you think about it, tire particles are composed of multiple chemicals through the synthesis. Also, we also wonder about like, what about the chemicals happen, their fate under the sunlight as well. And the second, we also examine the toxicity of this reaches <clears throat> from tire particles. So this is the laboratory experiment. So we need definitely <clears throat> micron size of tire air particles and mimicking the rear environment, the rear tire air particles. So this is the actually provided by the Harpo lab <clears throat> at Oregon State University. We have a two questions here. So tire particles will leach chemicals in water, you know, in our experiments. And then the second question is that is a smaller particles, like a micron size of tire air particles leach more chemicals compared to the large pieces. This is the one question that <clears throat> if we focus on the chemicals leaching from the plastics, really the size matters. So the experimental setup is based on this two, um, different sizes. One is the large uh, tire particles. We've made about one milliliter 
and the small tire wear particles is less than 90 micron size, you know, so the same amount of the tire particles in the same amount of water. And then we have the experiments like a different days. So if this tire wear particles in the water for different times, is that the chemicals are going to leach more and more. And then what if these chemicals are leaching in the one day even, you know, this is the very fundamental questions to us. And then after that, and then what happened to these chemicals if they are exposed to the sunlight? And then what does leachate gonna cause toxicity? So the first result I'm showing here, I hope you can follow this. It's basically the title shows the result. So here, the bottom of the graph is the basically the control. We always have the control experiments without tire wear particles, but in the, in the seawater only. And then the black one is the large pieces of tire wear particles. We have always duplicates experiments. So you can see the A and B. And the red is the fine particles. It's the micron size of tire wear particles. We also have a two duplicates as well. The y-axis that she shows a dissolved organic carbon. This is one way of the calculate, quantifying it, how much organic chemicals are coming out in the leachate, is, are present in the leachate. So if the numbers dissolve organic carbon is high, that means there are more chemicals in the leachate. The x-axis is the days. So we, we experimented one day, three days, six days, 12 days. You can see that the same amount of tire particles the smaller size, the micron size tire particles leach larger amounts of chemicals than large pieces tire wear particles. At the same time, and the over time, total organic chemicals concentration has increased over time as well. So if it was in the water for longer period, the more chemicals are coming out, okay? And we also checked that what those chemicals are exactly. We show the total organic, total amount of chemicals in the leachate. What chemicals it can be. The, the, the graph shows that number of potential compounds, basically number of chemicals that we found in the same leachate. So that over time, you can see the baseline of the control also going up. But in the, if you can tell, the small tire wear particles, large tire wear particles, both have a lot more chemicals than the control, okay? And then uh, also over time, more chemicals are, number of chemicals are leach from the tire wear particles as well. Some of them chemicals we are able to identify and then these are just at least a few of them. You can see that actual chemicals we found is several hundred chemicals in the leachate. But these are the something, the chemicals that we want to address it here is very interesting. The first chemical is especially the 66 PPD quinone. It was the same compound that the Science Magazine paper, they actually found that it causes the toxicity in Pacific Northwest Cova salmon. We um, tested further of this leachate under UV irradiation to mimic the sunlight environments. So we currently the, the analyze the, what the chemicals in this leachate exposed to the sunlight. And then um, this is currently, the analysis currently in progress. In addition that we tested the toxicity of this leachate. Zebra fish is one of the animal model organism which can serve the human toxicity and also aquatic toxicity as well. And then this is very simplified the slide. And then there's A, B, C. The A is the control. There's exposure to normal water and totally fine. And there's a normal zebra fish environment condition in the tank. The B is exposed to the leachate under dark conditions. So basically there's no sunlight. It's the, the leachate has no sunlight. It's basically the leachate, the tire wear particle leachate made under dark condition. And that was tested to the zebra fish. The C is that the leachate was made under sunlight, solar conditions. 
So it's all the tests were replicates, you know, that we followed the very uh, strict um, experimental conditions. And this is the one of the each is very symbolic, the representative image. So what you can Just see- one more minute. Okay, what you can see is that the, you can see the deformation compared to the A control A. So B and C, both those zebra fish exposed to the leachate show the deformation. And also that when we tested the dose response, it also worked. So more doses ex um, exposed and then we see higher toxicity. Okay, I'm ending my presentation. I hope this is okay. Thank, thank you very much, Unha, I really appreciate it. And um, next, I, um, I thought I was going to be introducing Senator Ben Allen. Um, his um, uh, senior consultant is here, Tina Andalina. Yeah. So Tina, maybe I'll- Oh, oh maybe I'm gonna here. interrupt you. We actually have the <laughs> Senator here. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so- we we've got they, they call the Democratic Caucus meeting for the Senate. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come give a little, give a little presentation, um, maybe answer a question, and then and then Tina will be here uh, to answer any additional follow up questions, so I can get back to the, the other meeting, and then I'll try to come back if, if it finishes. Well, thank so they, thank they gave you. us a nice little room here in the historic capital for us to take this. Thank thank you so much for making the extra effort. Let me just introduce you briefly, and then I'll um, I'll turn it over to you. So um, uh, Senator Ben Allen represents the 26th Senate District, which covers West Side, Hollywood, and coastal South Bay communities of Los Angeles County. Um, Senator Allen is a leader on environmental issues, chairing the, uh, both the Environmental Caucus and the Environmental Quality Committee. He's a member of the Ocean Protection Council as well. Senator Allen has a law degree from uh, UC Berkeley. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Fantastic, okay, here we go. Are you able to see our, our slides? Yes. Okay, great. If, if there's any, well, oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, can you see, it says Ocean Day 2022? Yes. Perfect, okay, all right. Well, well um, we've got a little presentation about the, 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 the plastic policy landscape. You've obviously now heard uh, quite a bit about the science. Uh, and some of the work that's happening on the regulatory side, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been happening on the uh, on the political side. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll I'll be here for a bit, and then Tina, who's been working so hard on on our on our efforts, can answer some additional questions. But uh, you know, certainly it's clear from everything we've been discussing so far uh, that we really need consistent and permanent policies in place that will reduce the amount of plastic pollution that leaches into our environment and our bodies. And that's why we introduced SB 54, uh, which is a, a, a bill that's been on the, on the docket for a little while now, which seeks to establish a comprehensive framework for reducing plastic pollution. Uh, the legislation has three key pillars. First of all, it would require producers to reduce at the source the amount of throwaway packaging and food service wear as much as possible. Uh, you know, we continue to see so much over packaging out there in the market. Uh, as well as disposable can containers instead of reusable ones. The, the second pillar of the bill, uh, SB 54, requires that whatever's left on the market has to be truly recyclable or compostable. And when I say truly recyclable, I mean, we need to, you know, we, we need more than just simply giving Californians that good feeling uh, from sorting a bottle into a blue recycling bin just because they see the recycling symbol on there. Uh, we, we need that bottle to really be recycled, entirely recycled. Uh, turned into another product, which is then recycled into yet another product over and over and over again. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that are technically recyclable, tech, but they, they don't end up getting recycled in the end of the day. Um, and of course, part of that involves building up markets to, to, to take that recycling uh, material that, to turn it into a new product. And so um, that that's that's uh, something that's that's a, that's an important part of this as well. And that's one of the reasons why we have really ambitious um, in recycling rates with our bill. The third pillar is shifting the burdens of managing packaging material to the producers instead of our city and county governments, or really uh, uh, where they are right now with, with individual consumers. We put so much responsibility on the consumer to do the right thing and recycle or, or sort their their trash. 
uh, and, and in the end of the day, the folks who really have the most power over whether these items are going to end up uh, in the river or in a landfill or turned into another product are the producers. And yet right now they have no skin in the game. There's no accountability. There's no role that they play really, or, or at least no required role um, when it comes to thinking about the end use of their product. So the bill allows producers uh, a great deal of flexibility on how to achieve the mandates, uh, but it does require them to work together you know, through what are called producer responsibility organizations to increase efficiency. And um, uh, this, you know, the, 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 this, is, this is really about both mandating, but also empowering producers to, uh, to, to, take, to take the lead in this area. Um, you know, <clears throat> you know we, we, we had situations where you know, when one producer, for example, changed the resin type of a particular detergent bottle. And that was a decision they made for aesthetic reasons. And it, literally that one decision rendered the product non-recyclable. Um, and, and as I say, before, there, there, was, there was no consequence at all. There's no, literally, uh, the, the consequence, well, there is a consequence. The consequence is not just environmental, as we've been discussing, but it's also um, the, the ever-increasing costs on cities and on consumers. Uh, you know, cities used to be making money off of recycling all the material they would collect. Now they're actually losing money just to be able to meet their, uh, their, their uh, diversion goals. And so much of this has to do with the fact that the Chinese implemented their national sword policy, which ended the practice of shipping off so much of our recycled material uh, to, to, to China. Of course, the whole thing was, you know, we were living a lie. So much of that material was ended up ending up incinerated or in, in rivers in Asia. So uh, now what, one of the things that we struggle with is that you know, virgin plastic material is so cheap, right? And, and uh, and so in nearly every case, a producer who has no, you know, no, no incentive to do any better will opt for the cheap virgin plastic option. Uh, it's cheap, of course, at the point of sale. It's not cheap for us as a society. Um, uh, but, and of course, that ends up creating a, 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 a vicious cycle because it, it also undermines the market for recycled material. People keep doubling down on the cheap uh, virgin material and so they're not turning to recycling markets to buy plastic material to produce the next generation of, of plastic products. So by requiring that packaging achieve higher rate, producers will pursue more sustainable alternatives, and we hope to create a virtuous cycle. So the bill pushes producers to invest in, in a robust reuse and refill infrastructure. Uh, it, it, it calls uh, for a shift from material types that cannot be recycled, meaning that they're destined for the landfill, or an incinerator or lost or littered uh, in the environment. And third, uh, uh, the bill pushes producers to build the market for post-consumer content that will also boost collection efforts, keeping material out of the oceans, rivers, uh, and, and every corner of our communities. And our goal ultimately here is to create the infrastructure and push companies to make sustainable material so that consumers don't have to think twice when standing at their disposal bins trying to determine if some, something should go into the trash or into the recycling bin. And in addition, when they're at the store, but they're not having to sit there deciding you know, what, what's a more environmentally friendly option when, when they have so few tools to even evaluate that, that quest, the answer to that question. Uh, let, let me touch on a couple of the, um, the, the, the few critical elements that, of the policy that we're developing. And, and, and certainly, you know, uh, Tina can answer more questions about this when you go into Q&A because she's been leading this negotiation. But um, on source reduction, uh, uh, the goal is to reduce the overall amount of plastic packaging and food uh, where that come into the system in the first place. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, 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 a tough thing to define. And it's certainly, I think, proving to be uh, one of the stickiest portions of our, of our negotiation. Uh, we know that recycling alone is not going not, not gonna to do enough to ensure that we keep plastics out of the environment. We're looking to achieve an, an initial reduction measured against the baseline. So for example, we require producers to reduce the amount of packaging on the market by 25%. Measured against the market, you know, the amount of the market in say like 2023, similar to what we did with greenhouse gas emissions, where we were looking at reductions you know, below 1990 levels, for example. Then we'll put in tools. Uh, we'll, we'll put tools in place to ensure those reductions are sustained, even as uh, businesses in our economy. Um, of course, we also want to make sure that we're not penalizing companies that have done the right thing by reducing uh, uh, packaging in the past. So um, they they need to be given a little more leeway. Um, now, these tools that I talk about uh, would include reuse and refill mandates, prohibiting access uh, um, 
uh, you know, uh, prohibiting like excessive packaging, um, shifting products out of uh, plastic packaging altogether. And then by, by 2032, the remaining packaging or food, uh, foodware that's still on the market would then, then have to be sustainable, uh, meaning that it's fully recyclable or compostable. So to ensure that we drive industry to create the end markets necessary to collect and process the material, we include mandated recycling rates that ramp up to 75% by 2032. Again, this will guarantee that the you know, producers buy the material that consumers are throwing into the recycling bin and turn that into new packaging. And of course, if manufacturers don't buy the material, then it will fail, uh, then, then, then the, uh, the manufacturers will fail to meet the required rates and, and, and then their products will be prohibited in, in the state. Um, whoops, are you guys? Yeah, we're, uh, we're still here. <laughs> okay, you have stopped screen like sharing. Are you able to? Again. Sorry, okay. whoever was sharing the screen. All right, we'll go, we'll go back to that. We'll again. go back to the screen share. Let's see, start broadcast. I don't know, that's strange. Okay, you've been seeing the, seeing the slides, okay? Yes, we have. Okay, great, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, the bill calls for a, um, uh, for, for formation of uh, producer responsibility organizations, which would be subject to state oversight. Uh, so, the, you know, the, so these would be these organizations that the producers would come together and form, and they'd be run by the organizations. They're the ones who know their products the best, but then the state would have a role in, in overseeing and holding uh, them accountable to, to ensuring that they're meeting their various rates and dates. Uh, you know, I also want to um, uh, point out that the one tool that we're looking into that we've seen work really well in Europe and elsewhere is eco-modulated fees. So this is where you have producers who choose to use packaging that's harder or more expensive to handle. Um, those folks pay more into the recycling system uh, to recognize the fact that their product is harder to handle. It's, al it's almost, it's not exactly like a cap and trade, but it's got echoes of that. The idea is that if, if for whatever reason their business model requires these more difficult products, uh, less recyclable, less environmentally friendly products, they would basically pay into the system um, to, to help the system better handle the, the collection and, and sorting and recycling of the product. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, part of the idea here is, is that we, we don't want to have a situation where we have one company subsidizing another company's decision. There's a, there's a free rider, freeloader problem here that, we, that we're trying to address through the, the, through the exploration of of eco-modulated fees that can then um, also hopefully drive industry to make more sustainable packaging decisions. All right, so um, we came achingly close to passing this bill uh, uh, almost two years ago uh, at the end of session. Um, so, what's, so what's happened? Well, we now have a group of, of, um, of, of supporters uh, from, there's an interesting combination of folks from the waste industry and the environmental community who came together to qualify a measure for the 2022 ballot, uh, which is an aggressive uh, plastics measure that's similar to what we'd proposed, but it's got some differences. Um, the, the ballot measure, of course, um, polls very well, uh, though we also know that if industry spends a gazillion dollars attacking it, um, you know, it could really jeopardize its chances of passage. And I think that's put everyone in a place where they're actually interested in trying to negotiate. If we could, we have, we have this mechanism in the legislature where if we can negotiate a, a legislative deal uh, that would make the, the you know, promoters, the, the supporters of the ballot measure pull back the ballot measure because they feel like whatever legislation we pass is strong enough, then we can take that path instead and avoid the unpredictability and the expense of going to the ballot. So we've got stakeholders uh, come to the table. They're, they are, they are you know, involved in a very intense negotiation to see if we can find a legislative solution that would enable the ballot measure supporters to draw the initiative. The negotiations have been difficult. Um, there are a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different perspectives. Uh, plus, we also have a real tight deadline. Uh, you know, we have till the end of June, basically, to pass a bill before the Secretary of State, who's our Chief Elections Officer, starts the process of, of certifying everything uh, for the state ballot and finalizing the statewide voter information guide. So the idea is that this deal is only going to go through if the ballot measure gets pulled. So we're really um, stuck uh, with the deadline of, of, of when the ballot measure has to be pulled. Um, but, but I think we're in a place now where we really do believe that because of the potential for this expensive ballot battle that I was talking about, the industry is now eager to get to an agreement on the legislative side. And I'm really proud of the progress we've made. We, you know, we, we've, we've certainly, um, not only in terms of 
the negotiations, but also just the, our, our previous efforts. And so many people on this Zoom have been a part of this effort just to raise the profile of this plastics pollution problem. Um, we've gotten members of the legislature, people in the, in the political world, the policy world to focus on this issue uh, uh, in ways that they just simply weren't a couple of years back. They just, this was an off of people's radar screens. And I think our collective effort together, our office and our great allies, um, you know, uh, Senator Skinner and, 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 and Assemblyman Gonzalez and Rivas and, and uh, Stern and Wiener and uh, I mean, this, you know, Becker, it's been a, been a great team of folks who've been working really hard on, on, on these issues. Comlog, the long list of, of fantastic legislators who've been working a lot in this space. And, and I think those of us on the legislative side and, and those of you on the advocacy side and the science side have been working hard to raise the profile of this issue so that, that now many, many more of our colleagues feel like they really need to do something, that we need to act, that they feel badly that we haven't acted, they feel badly that they stood in the way perhaps of previous efforts to, to do the right thing. So I think now we're at a point where it's uh, no longer a question of if we will pass a comprehensive policy to end the use of unsustainable packaging and, and food service wear, uh, but, but, but more how it will get done. Does it get done through a legislative initiative, ballot measure? Does it happen um, you know, uh, this year, we, we hope, uh, or, or will we continue to kick the can? Uh, uh, you know, either we'll pass a bill or the voters will have their say. And, and, that, and you know, that's, it's kind of forced the question, it's called the question. So uh, anyhow, uh, I, you know, I, I, I do want to thank everyone on this um, slide, uh, uh, sorry, on the Zoom for, for all your advocacy. You've, you've helped to get us to this point where we're so close to getting really, really meaningful policy passed that I think will have uh, you know, global implications uh, uh, and it's certainly national uh, as, our, as our friends in Congress struggle to get good legislation passed there that even come close to what we're, what we're talking about here in California. Uh, so anyhow, um, we've, we've been, uh, uh, Tina on my team is right here. She's going to be part of the Q&A. Um, I'm happy to take questions to you right now before I get back to my caucus. And I'll, as I say, I'll try to come back later. But here's her email. If anyone wants to contact her, if you have thoughts or suggestions, if you want to be part of this conversation, please do, do reach out to us. I really appreciate your interest in this topic. Yep. Thank you so much, Senator Allen. We really appreciate you, especially with such a, a busy schedule. I'm, I'm going to try to... Um, tee up one question for you before you head off. And I, I know you just talked a little bit about the ballot measure, but we have a, a question that came in from uh, Roberta and maybe you can expand on what you just said. She's asking, um, do you see the ballot initiative as a complement or a hindrance to SB 54? And are you confident that Cal Recycle uh, will be able to fulfill its role in this process? Yeah. I mean, look, in, on balance, it is absolutely a compliment. Um, there are some things, uh, because, because it really has forced the conversation um, with industry. Now, that being said, we came so close to passing a uh, really comprehensive policy on our own that the ballot measure has um, also kind of taken a lot of attention. And I do, um, you know, I do quite frankly worry that if, if we're not able to strike a deal, and we do go to ballot and industry spends, I don't know, $125 million just pummeling people with negative messaging and the thing loses by a little bit, um, we could really get set back. That's my, that is my biggest, I mean, if, if, if there's a possible road for this measure being a hindrance, that's my big fear. Uh, so, so it's part of why I'm so anxious for us to strike a deal first uh, if we're not able to, we all, it has to be all hands on deck to get this thing passed, and that includes raising money. Um, uh, there are certainly some folks out there who are interested in helping to finance our efforts, but um, you know, it's going to have to be really serious money given the possible uh, industry money that might be spent. So, um, so, so yeah, I, I, it's, 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 it's a good thing, but it's risky. Uh, uh, and then what was the second part of the question? Amy, excuse me. Do you feel uh, do you feel confident in Cal Recycle's uh, oh. ability to implement it? Yes. Well, so that's the other. That's, be quite frankly, one of the advantages of our legislative route is that we're, we're adding in we add in more specificity. One of the concerns about the ballot measure is that it's pretty vague about the role of Cal Recycle. They would certainly play an important role. It could really open up. Uh, you know, it, it, I think we're concerned about potential for a lot of litigation. Um, 
So, uh, uh, you know, and, and quite frankly, I mean, one of the things we heard over and over again while we were struggling to get those extra couple of votes to get us over the finish line a couple of years ago was a lack of confidence in calorie cycle from the legislators. Not that they're, you know, so you know, calorie cycle, I think everyone, there's new leadership there. I think there's, um, I think if we were to pass something like this or the ballot measure, um, they'd have to really you know, step up their game over a calorie cycle to be able to handle a project like this. I think, you know, I, would, I just can't imagine this issue is, he actually wrote, wrote about circularity. Um, I, 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 I would just really hope at least that he would do everything he could to make sure that, you know, that we had a really great program in place and the calorie cycle was absolutely ready. But it's, a, it's an ambitious thing we'd be asking them to do. Now, of course, part of what we're trying to do is keep the onus on the producers and really you know, calorie cycle's role ultimately is to, is to hold them accountable um, and to enforce and to hold accountability with regards to the rates and dates. But um, it's one of the many complicated aspects of this, of this delicate negotiation. Okay, thank you. I just want to check in with the Ocean Day organizers. Do, do we possibly have time? Can we go maybe five minutes over to 12.55? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have a, um, a question for Scott. Um, so as we were preparing for this event, um, Scott was relaying to, uh, to us some um, some interesting things about federal funding for this type of work. And I was hoping, Scott, you could uh, uh, relay a little bit of that to the audience. So in our human health risk assessment, we identified some research gaps, mostly around the hazards of particles to humans. And we conducted a survey of the available grants right now that have been uh, uh, allocated for research in the United States and elsewhere uh, to, to fulfill these research gaps. We found that the US has contributed a little bit over $100,000 total to the study of the human health effects of microplastics. Uh, it's currently one uh, pilot project funded through the NIH, uh, whereas the European Commission has awarded over 30 million euros to uh, a wide number of projects. So we can't just depend on Europe to fulfill these research needs. It seems like the US has an uh, opportunity to step up our game in terms of allocating some research funding to this uh, desperately needed uh, uh, question about whether or not microplastics are actually affecting humans. Thank you, Scott. And uh, a question came in through chat that I, I think uh, is best directed to Unha. Um, Rob asks, has anyone looked at zinc? A powerful ecotoxicant, eco tire rubber may have 1,000 ppm of zinc. I think there are some papers, I think, definitely related to zinc. Uh, but in our project, we specifically focus on organic chemicals because there is a huge data gap up there. Yeah. Thank you. And I think one, um, one for Tina. Excuse me, I'm trying to find it. Um, I believe it was, um, I'm not seeing it right now, but I believe it was, uh, will single use mask um, such that we've been using during COVID, would that fall under SB 54? No, so SB 54 covers packaging. So if your mask came in a plastic package, the plastic package it came in would be covered or single use foodware. So utensils, cups, plates, bowls, that sort of thing. But um, initially, when we first introduced the measure, it was all single use items. And then we spent about six months trying to figure out what constituted a single use item. Like your mask, you use it five or six times. Does that make it single use or not? Even tires came up. You know, you put them on your car once. Is that single use? Or because you use them for, you know, whatever, 60,000 miles, 10,000, I actually have no idea. You know, is that a multi use item? So we had to actually be specific and, and focus on packing and wear. Great. Okay, well, I think um, I think that is probably all the, the time we have today. So I just wanna 
Again, thank our speakers, um, Dr. Scott Coffin from the um, State Water Board, Dr. Unha Ho from San Diego State University, Dr. Or, I'm sorry, Senator Ben Allen and um, Tina Andalina. And also want to thank um, our partners from the California Ocean Science Trust, and particular, particularly Dr. Liz Whiteman and um, Kia Bibby. And um, uh, hopefully, folks have also received through the chat our speaker biographies and a briefing sheet on the topic of microplastics and microfibers. Um, part of my job is if uh, anybody uh, would like to connect with a CSU faculty member doing research in this area, you can um, get in touch with me and I will put you in touch quickly with someone who can answer your questions. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And I think now I'm uh, turning it back over to Laura for the next event. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. And I saw there was some there were some questions in the chat, like whether uh, will you have a copy of the recording? And yes, the answer is yes, we will have a copy of the recording to share. So for anyone who had to miss any portion, we'll be able to get that out. We also shared it on the on Facebook Live. So you can head to, I believe, CSU Coast Facebook page, as well as the Environment California Facebook page. Um, it was shared simultaneously, the wonders of technology on both of those. Um, and so you can check it out there. And then we did a Zoom recording, so we can, um, we can just email that out as well. Um, and then there was a question about bios and fact sheets. Um, just to make sure those are handy for everyone. We can drop those back in at the bottom of the chat in case you had to leave and come back. Um, and thank you, Amy, so much. And thank you to all of the panelists. That was such an informative panel about this growing threat of tiny, tiny plastic. Um, and some of those facts, I don't think I'll ever be able to shake or like <laughs> the idea of how much microplastic we are consuming without even knowing it. Um, and what an urgent call to action to work to reduce that threat. Um, so, and then uh, for, I know that folks are, um, zipping in and out of legislative meetings, many of the participants. And so wanted to just take a minute and um, do a quick reminder that if you are doing any uh, lobby meetings, make sure that you're getting the notes from those meetings into the, um, the Google form we're collecting today. Um, we want those all collected by the end of the day today so that any follow up can happen right away. And um, if you need the link to the I'm going to drop the link to the notes in the in the chat as well so that you also have that. Um, and then we're going to get started in another couple of minutes. We have, um, we're joined today, we're so grateful to be joined today uh, by Violet Sage Walker, who's the chairwoman for the, uh, the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, and she's going to provide another uh, keynote address. Um, and we're going to also get to watch a really cool video in a moment. So definitely encourage folks to hang, hang on, um, stick around for that great panel. I mean, keynotes. <laughs> Uh, and then one other announcement, if people have questions for the panelists that you didn't get to ask earlier, um, you can still drop them in the chat or send an email to any of the panel organizers at CSU Coast or to uh, the Ocean Day organizers and we'll work to make sure we get those questions to the panelists so that um, folks can get their questions answered too.